you have your Bibles, we will continue in 1 Samuel. I didn't have to preach the slaughter of the priests at Nob, so I can now continue on. For those that were here last week, we had our D-Now weekend, um, and uh, our new student minister, Shane Hufford, came and he drew the short straw, and uh, it's where the passage fell, but it went very well with the idea of brave, which was the theme of the weekend, and in many ways, you see uh, uh, Himelech, who is the priest, uh, demonstrate a bravery uh, towards King Saul that uh, few were able to muster. I, I found it ironic as I was reading through that part of uh, chapter 22. No one, like Saul refuses to say David's name, like over and over again. He just calls him the son of Jesse, the son of Jesse. Doag, who's coming and tattletailing on David, says, yeah, yeah, I saw the son of Jesse. Like, I'm not going to say his name either. If you're not saying it, I'm not saying it. And then Ahimelech, when questioned, says, I pray for David, and I won't stop. And it led ultimately to his death and the death of everyone in his family and the priestly line um, there in Nob. But it was certainly um, a trust in the Lord and an acknowledgement of God and his authority over Saul's rhetoric and fear. And this morning, we're going to dive in, and we're going to see some people still responding to Saul in fear and the way that they um, live out their kind of journeys. I've entitled the message this morning, In Step with God, because we're going to see David, who kind of got a little off, a little desperate as he was fleeing, now kind of gathering himself He's got his parents situated. He's got a, a band now that uh, has kind of gathered to him, a, ba a band of misfits in a lot of ways, uh, those who are discontented, uh, those who are struggling, but they have now rallied around him, and he has become their captain. And word comes to David. And so if you have your place, if you would stand, and let's uh, read God's word, and I'm I'm going to put these on just so it makes it easier. Oh, look at that. I know. It came that day. All right. Then they told David, saying, Behold, the Philistines are fighting against Keilah and are plundering the threshing floors. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and attack these Philistines? And the Lord said to David, Go and attack the Philistines and deliver Keilah. But David's men said to him, um, Behold, we are afraid here in Judah. How much more than if we go to Keilah against the ranks of the Philistines? Then David inquired of the Lord once more, and the Lord answered him and said, Arise, go down to Keilah, for I will give the Philistines into your hand. So David and his men went to Keilah and fought with the Philistines, and he led away their livestock and struck them with a great slaughter. Thus David delivered the inhabitants of Keilah. Now it came about when Abiathar, the son of Ahimelech, fled to David at Keilah, that he came down with an ephod in his hand. And when it was told Saul that David had come to Keilah, Saul said, God has delivered him into my hand, for he shut himself in by entering a city with double gates and bars. So Saul summoned all the people for war to go down to Keilah to besiege David and his men. Now David knew that Saul was plotting evil against him. And so he said to Abiathar, the priest, bring the ephod here. Then David said, O Lord, God of Israel, your servant has heard for certain that Saul is seeking to come to Keilah to destroy the city on my account. Will the men of Keilah surrender me into his hand? Will Saul come down just as your servant has heard? O Lord, God of Israel, I pray, tell your servant. And the Lord said, he will come down. And then David said, a good follow-up question, will the men of Keilah surrender me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, they will surrender you. Then David and his men, about 600, arose and departed from Keilah, and they went wherever they could go. When it was told Saul that David had escaped from Keilah, he gave up the pursuit. And David stayed in the wilderness of the strongholds and remained in the hill country of the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul sought him every day, but God did not deliver him into his hand. 
Now David became aware that Saul had come out to seek his life while David was in the wilderness of Ziph at Horesh. And Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David at Horesh and encouraged him in God. Thus he said to him, Do not be afraid, because the hand of Saul, my father, will not find you, and you will be king over Israel, and I will be next to you. And Saul, my father, knows that also. Ouch. So the two of them made a covenant before the Lord. David stayed at Horesh while Jonathan went to his house. Then Ziphites came up to Saul at Gibeah and said, Is David not hiding with us in the stronghold at Horesh on the hill of Hakalah, which is in the south of uh, Jeshmana or Yeshimon? Sorry. Now then, O king, come down according to all the desire of your soul to do so. And our part shall be to surrender him into the king's hand. Now Saul said, may you be blessed of the, of the Lord, for you have had compassion on me. So go now and make more sure and investigate and see this place where his haunt is and who has seen him there. For I am told that he is very cunning. So look and learn about all the hiding places where he hides himself and return to me with certainty. And I will go with you. And if he is in the land... I will search him out among all the thousands of Judah. Then they arose and went to Ziph before Saul. Now David and his men were in the wilderness of Moab and in the Arabah of the south of Yeshimon. Then Saul and his men went to seek him and they told David and he came down to the rock and stayed in the wilderness of uh, uh, Maon probably. And when Saul heard it, he pursued David in the wilderness of Maon. And Saul went on one side of the mountain, and David and his men on the other side of the mountain. And David was hurrying to get away from Saul, for Saul and his men were surrounding David and his men to seize them. But a messenger came to Saul, saying, Hurry and come, for the Philistines have made a raid on the land. And so Saul returned from pursuing David and went to meet the Philistines. Therefore, they called that place the Rock of Escape. David went up from there and stayed in the strongholds of En Gedi. Father, as we um, now sit under your word and we hear the things that you have spoken to us, I pray that you would um, bring them to bear on our hearts and minds. Father, take the the accounts that you have recorded for a reason and let us see those reasons. And for the way that they apply to us in our circumstances and in our lives and in our journeys and in our moments right now. I thank you that we believe in a living word. One who continues to speak because he stands at the right hand of the Father. One through your Holy Spirit brings illumination and understanding, conviction, and courage. And I pray that you would help us to respond as your people in response to the shepherd who speaks. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. In step with God. One of the things that I love about David, and I think we would all agree, is that um, David loves his people. He is the the good shepherd picture um, of the one who is the good shepherd, God the Father. We have in David a shepherd boy that cares not as a hireling, but as someone who is devoted to his people. And so he hears a message as we begin in verse 1 in Keilah. The people there are having their harvests ransacked. Um, I'm reminded, is it a bug's life or something where the bad guys come and like at harvest time and take away all their food? That They got this right out of here. I mean, Disney all the time, stealing the narratives of Scripture. But this is one of those moments. Um, This valley was known to be a valley filled with corn. This was a place where there was much production. And so... Here the Philistines have let the Israelites do the work and they are coming to raid and and they're so confident that they can walk in and just take over. They bring their livestock evidently, it says. David's shoes off the livestock. They brought them for a reason. It's to take care of their animals, to take care of their needs. 
And what that would mean to the people of Keilah would mean not just great frustration that they did all the work, but potential starvation for them and their livestock because their supplies would be stripped away. And so in the midst of running for his life and fleeing from the ones who are supposed to be his allies and friends, David hears of the distress of the people of God, and he is willing to go against the enemies of God. David comes to the Lord and asks for guidance. His heart is for his people, the Lord's people, and he asks God, should I go? You know all the implications in that, Lord. I'm hiding, trying to escape Saul, but should I still go, make myself known, and in defense of your people, bring deliverance? The Lord says, yes. So David looks at his men and says, guys, we have our first mission. And they go, we're not in that, and we're what, huh? Like, look back at chapter 22. Everyone, verse 2, everyone who was in distress, everyone who was in debt, everyone who was discouraged gathered to him. This is not the ranks of a highly trained, readied, mobilized unit for the protection of the people of God. And so their, their natural response, um, you do realize we're running scared now. You want to compound that by going up against the ranks of a military garrison in the Philistines. This sounds like Jesus when he's just almost been killed in Jerusalem and they leave the city. And he says, hey, we're going back into the city. And the disciples are like, you do realize that if we, we were just trying to be killed there and and I just want to put this in because Thomas always gets a bad rap. And so this, is, this was Thomas' moment to shine as a disciple. This is when he said, we will not only go there with you, but we will die with you. This is, that was one of Thomas' best lines of all time. It needs to get out there for him on his behalf. I'm there for him. But it's, it's kind of the, the Old Testament picture of this. We are running scared, and you want us instead to go even further. And yet, David here goes back to the Lord, and the Lord responds. The Lord tells him, yes, arise, go to Keilah, for I will give the Philistines into your hand. David comes back to his men and says, guys, this battle isn't yours. This battle is the Lord's. I've been there. I know the fears, but God is in control. And the Philistines do not come against the armies of the living God. And so his men go. The band of brothers do exactly what David has said, and they see victory through what David in God had promised. He's been there. He leads them now to victory. And I can imagine the hearts of these men as they're going, okay. We can follow, this is good. Like, you even notice, they had like some type of altar call or something because they got 200 more to follow. They had 400 in chapter 22. Now they got 600 by the time of chapter 23. Like, God is bringing people alongside David and surrounding him and giving him victory. And yet, we keep reading the story, there's no rest, no, for the, there's no spoils, there's no glory. Because immediately upon doing this, David hears that Saul's on his way. And so, here's a word of wisdom for us. Even when we help others in aid, it doesn't guarantee that they will protect us. The linen ephod, which Abiathar has, is brought to David at his request, and he again goes to the Lord. Now, the ephod was a, um, a very beautiful, uh, kind of extravagant garment. It would have uh, been adorned by the priests. And they, they may have had the, the umen and the thumen there, and um, it was a way for divination. It was a way to go to the Lord and to ask of the Lord what he would desire. And so David sees that this has been brought, and Abiathar brings it to him. And now we have this moment where he says, 
So is Saul coming, Lord? And will these people fight with me or are they going to give me up? And God answers him, he is coming. And yes, they are going to hand you over as quick as they can. That was my interpretation. And so David now is on the run. He must leave. The people of the city, though probably grateful for the help that they've received, are fearful of Saul and his men and are going to hand him over if he comes. Saul's influence, his pressure, and the fear of him was very real. Remember the last chapter. Nob has just seen 85 priests and their families, children, and livestock killed for standing in Saul's way. Easily this city knew that it could be next. No one wants to get caught in the crossfire here. But God's in control and God takes care of him. It says by the end of it, as they flee from there, knowing that Saul is coming, I don't know, I mean there's, you, we have social media and instant media now. Evidently, they've got some, some underground communications that people are kind of letting everybody know where everybody's at. And so David gets out of Dodge, and then Saul finds out that David got out of Dodge. And it says that he continues to seek him in beautiful words in the end of verse 14. God did not deliver him into his hand. And so you have this this protection offered by God for him. And then you have this beautiful moment. Saul can't find him, but Jonathan can. Jonathan comes to him. And David is met by Jonathan. And in this moment, you have a, another um, kind of declaration of what the future will be. And this is as uh, non-cryptic as you can be. This is where it is spelled out, everybody's on the same page. Whether you're fighting for it or against it, that's another matter, but everybody's on the same page. Jonathan says to him, do not be afraid. The hand of my father will not um, find you. You will be king over Israel, and I will be next to you. And Saul, my father, knows that also. Saul knows that the heart of his son has turned to David and is supporting David and um, reaching out to David, keeping David informed of what is going on, evidently. And so they make a covenant again, again reaffirming that relationship and that trust of one another, remembering a new king coming in and an old king going out. That would have been a, a huge kind of point of friction there, and yet David has promised to watch over and to take care of Jonathan. Well, I wonder who the uh, Ziphite Zo uh, Doag is, but the Ziphites evidently catch wind that Jonathan has been there and David is evidently amongst them. And so the Ziphites are very quick to go to Saul to expose him. They gain favor with the king in verse 21. Look what he says. May the Lord, may you be blessed of the Lord for you have had compassion on me. And so Saul finally finds a friend. It has been a point of contention. Doeg's tried to prove himself to him, but no one is giving him right intelligence. But finally, here are some people that give him some good intelligence. And so now they offer themselves to surrender over David if he will come down. I love what Saul says. Go down, make more sure, investigate, see the place where his haunt is. My Bible says haunt. Uh, the, the word here in Hebrew is foot. But if you look at the context, I think the reason uh, that my Bible went with the word haunt is 23, it says, so look, learn about all the hiding places where he hides himself and return to me with certainty. Evidently, David was kind of like, I mean, he was this elusive thing, almost like a ghost, like he was there, but then he wasn't there, and I almost had him, but I didn't. And, and so he's really just kind of projecting this kind of idea that this, this guy is, is so slippery to catch, he's cunning. I, I like how he says, go make sure where he is, because I've heard he's cunning. <laughs> I've realized he's cunning. He's outwitted me every time. And so here they, they go, and they do this, and they say, yes, we've, we know he's here. And so come. And so Saul brings his men, and they're on the march, and they're on the move. And they're moving pretty quickly, evidently, because David's scattering. And it says in the passage that as David is trying to get away from Saul, that he sees himself starting to be surrounded. He's being hemmed in. Saul is on the precipice of catching him. And all of a sudden, 
there's a messenger. Hey, Saul, you got to take a time out. we got an urgent need. Saul realizes that he's got to do it. I don't think he knew how close he was to that moment of having David. Or he might have said, it's just like the video game. Just give me five more minutes, Dad. But he doesn't. He says, oh, I don't, I don't know where this ghost is at the moment. I don't know if I'm close or far. I don't know how close I really am, whether it's going to happen shortly or not. I need to take care of pressing matters, and he leaves. That's the picture of this chapter. And so I want to take some time now and give you some kind of points, some, some applications in the midst of this. I kind of walked through the passage, but now I want to kind of recircle back into it. And so if you're a, a note taker and you haven't had any yet, here is your first point. Serving God and his people is to continue even through adversity and fear. Verse 3, we are reminded of the very real reality that David and his men faced. These men, when they are told by David that the Lord has called them to go tackle the Philistine garrison, their words are, we are afraid. We are afraid. We're afraid here, right now, in this context. It can only get worse. And yet, I want you to just kind of see the picture of what happens. Verse 2, David inquires of God, and God says, go attack, and I want you to deliver them. And so David says, we're going to go attack, and we're going to deliver them. Their response is, we are afraid. But when God responds to David the second time, he says, go and attack, for I will be the one who delivers them. I will give you them. I will give them into your hands, verse 4. And then in verse 5, the result, David delivered the people, the inhabitants of Keilah. We are called as God's people to trust God, not just to flee, flee or try to get away from our problems, through David's leadership, these Israelites weren't just running from tough situations and finding peace and just sitting in it. They were still to find God's his peace and his power, but it was going to be amidst challenges as well. The reality is for every one of us, we have to realize that the world's peace that is offered this side of eternity actually doesn't exist. There are going to be trials and tribulations that we as God's people will continue to face over and over and over again. And there will be things that will potentially cause us great fear. And yet it does not sideline us or call us to run. Because there is still a God at work and there is still a God on his throne. And so we are not to just flee to smooth sailing and comfortable living. Just ask the disciples that very same question. Instead, there is to be a confidence in Christ despite all of those things. And when he calls us to respond, we are to step out in obedience. David represents this kind of life, this kind of faith. Because the flip side is this, self-preservation is the normal human response. Trusting in God isn't. Self-preservation is the normal human response in a fallen world. Even as the people of Keilah are saved by David and his men, they are willing to hand him over to their justifiably feared king. Notice what David does in this moment, though. He doesn't respond to them in anger. He doesn't turn on the people of Keilah and say, oh, I just delivered you, well, I'm just going to kill you because you have rejected me, you're going to hand me over. Because he doesn't entrust himself to them. He didn't do it to gain their approval. He doesn't do it just to gain their loyalty. And so therefore he is not shaken when they do not provide protection. He did it because it was the right thing to do. He followed God, he trusted God, and those were the next steps he was supposed to take. 
David knew the possibility of being found out was very real. And indeed, he is found out. It's really hard not to get found out when you go into battle and fight a war. But he was not willing to be unfaithful or disobedient. The people of Ziph, maybe, again, after learning of Jonathan's visit, maybe someone saw it. I wonder, does Jonathan have that same kind of sense of putting David in danger that David put um, Ahimelech in when Doag saw him? They don't want another Doag ratting them out. These Ziphites have heard what happened, and they in fear, with knowledge of David's presence among them, proactively seek out their feared king to surrender him into their hands. This is the normal way that we often respond in fear. Take us out of it, put the blame somewhere else, or hand it over so that we don't get in trouble. We don't, we're not associated with that. It becomes an idea instead of a truth to stand on. It becomes a way of thinking instead of what God has said. There's a very real reality in which we seek to preserve ourselves. When we go to share the gospel, what will they think about us? Becomes our number one concern. Too often, we are jaded by preserving Right here, me, myself, and I, and maybe my family. And yet God calls us to obedience. And in so doing, he does the next thing. He sovereignly and perfectly guards our steps. Do you understand that at any point, God could hand David over if he so chose He could have given David into Saul's hand. And yet he decided not to. God answers David very clearly and helps David understand exactly what is going on. Saul must be so frustrated. How is he knowing all of these things? It's because God is in control. God clearly directs David at many steps. The first one is to even go against the Philistines. In verse 2 and in verse 4, he clearly tells him. And then when David seeks out an understanding of what Saul is going to do in response, God again clearly tells him in verses 11 and 12. And then it is very clear again that God hides David from Saul. In verse 14, God did not deliver him into his hands. In verse 16, Jonathan comes and finds David even though Saul can't. And Jonathan says... God will not allow the hand of Saul, my father, to find you. And then, by the end of it, God clearly rescues David, even in a very scary moment. Nothing happens unless God determines or permits it. A sparrow does not hit the ground unless God knows, is what Matthew 10, 29 says. Job 42 I know you can do all things, Job says, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Even as God can thwart our enemies, he can also bring our friends alongside us. Jonathan is able to come, and look what it says again in verse 16. He comes and encourages him in God. Remember, David, I know this is hard. I I can't imagine... You're running at all times, fearing for your lives, and yet you're still going out and fighting the Lord's battles. Know that God is with you. Do not be afraid. Do you you have any of those people in your life that come alongside you and remind you of truth, remind you of God's promises? Are you that person for someone that you go and you're that Jonathan that meets as almost an oasis in a desert to say, no, listen, These things are so, these things are good. God is sovereign. He is in control. He is guarding your steps. Because it matters when we get into impossible situations. When the escape is growing impossible from our perspective, deliverance is always possible in God's economy. And it's to his glory. I mean, please understand, the scurry is real. The scurry of David's men 
trying to find anywhere they can get to and hide from Saul's um, pursuit is very real. I don't know if you've ever played a game where uh, your job was to get away and hide, and you know that they are right on your tail. Hopefully it wasn't with a cop, but it was with like some child that you, when you were eight years old, you know, running in the backyard. But there is a very real reality in which that kind of fear, you could imagine that stress, that strain in that moment that you are about to be caught and what happens then. And so you're just running to the hills trying to find any place to find cover. From a human perspective, there wasn't an option. They were being hemmed in. It says the scriptures that they were surrounding him. And so where was David to go? The confrontation was going to be inevitable. And his 600 now men who had gotten their first victory were about to be in another situation that was going to be a lot more challenging. And so what does God do? God, God doesn't tell David, I, I can't believe you just didn't sit there and just trust me and just hum, even though Saul's men are coming home. Like, I mean, he's active. He's moving, right? But what does, God, what does God ultimately do? He comes and bookends the chapter with the Philistines. The ones who were the enemies that had sent David into the situation are now the deliverers of David because they raid somewhere else and it draws the eye of Saul away. Do you get that? God can use the Philistines to move David to a spot and then move the Philistines to another spot to pull David or Saul from it. Like even the enemies of God are vessels that God can use to bring about his purposes in our lives. Do you hear that? The good, the bad, and the ugly, God still orchestrates to bring about the purposes in your life. Most ugly of all, we just celebrated. Most ugly of all was when his son went on a cross and died. Rejected by men, despised. And yet the perfect sacrifice that brought healing, forgiveness, and restoration. What if you had that perspective? Not that you sat by you are participating in what God is doing, but you exhibit a trust in Him that even though this looks impossible, even though my enemies surround me, yet I know that God reigns and He even ordains the steps of my enemies for His purposes and for my growth. Where does fear lie in that? It is broken because our God is bigger than it all. And he orchestrates every piece of it. I think of 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, it says, Behold, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening. Like we should not be shocked that this life is not easy he says, but to the degree you share in the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing so that the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exaltation. Do you realize that everything that we are going through gives us a better and better picture and understanding of who God is, his sovereignty, his goodness, his grace, his perseverance, his long suffering with us, all of that so that when we see him, we will worship him that much more beautifully. Do you have a, a big enough picture of God to understand that he's orchestrating all of these things so that you might know him better and walk with him more closely? This is the picture of David. Man, he gets himself into some incredible moments where he sees great victories, but he also is in some of the depths of despairs that sees God show up in ways that he would never have shown up had David not been walking with him. This is the last point. The favor and guidance of God is connected to our communion with him. 
David has confidence that he is supposed to go to the Philistines. Does it make sense? No. But is he supposed to go? Yes. Verse 7, the irony that Saul thinks God has delivered David into his hands. And the very clarity of Scripture in verse 14 to say, no, God has not and will not deliver. And then Saul's own son coming and reiterating, no, this will not happen. David is one who inquires of the Lord. Saul is one who assumes and presumes upon him. One is found in relationship and under the favor of God and under the protection of God. And one is exposing that he is not. I want to read this morning's Experiencing God devotion. I don't know if you've read it for today yet. This is when God orchestrates everything and puts it all together. Faith pleases God. Hebrews 11.6 Now without faith it is impossible to please God. For the one who draws near to him must believe that he exists and rewards those who seek him. Your relationship with God is largely determined by your faith. When you come to him, you must believe that he exists and he is exactly who he has revealed himself to be in the scriptures. You must also believe that he will respond to you when you earnestly seek him. Without this kind of faith, you cannot please God. Regardless of the morality of your life, the good works you perform, the words you speak, the sacrifices you make for his sake, If you do not have faith, you do not please him. It can be tempting to substitute religious activity for faith in God. Christians may claim they are being good stewards of their resources when in fact they are wanting to walk by sight rather than by faith. They may refuse to do what God tells them unless they can see all the resources in place first. You may say, I love God, but I just have difficulty trusting him then understand you are not pleasing to him. You cannot struggle at the core of your relationship with God and still enjoy a vibrant fellowship with him. Faith does not eliminate problems. Faith keeps you in a trusting relationship with God in the midst of your problems. Faith has to do with your relationship with God, not your circumstances. Some may say, I'm not much of a person of faith. I'm more of a practical person. Yet you will never do anything more practical than to place your trust in the Lord. Nothing is more secure or certain than that which you entrust to him. This picture is lived out in the life of David. A man who was running for his life, but at the same time had his steps ordained by the Father to bring about his perfect plan. And ultimately, one day through his lineage, the one who would give his life as a ransom for many. This Jesus Christ, the one whom we can trust. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you for the reminders this morning. The reminders of the people of Keilah and the people of Ziph that we can be in fear to the people of this world, the rulers of this world, the consequences of things in this world. Or we can be like David and his men. And I say and his men because they followed. And they got to see the same things. We can be people who seek you out, inquire of you, and we open your word and hear from you and have confidence in you. Lord, we don't have an ephod that we can lay out and have you speak to us. Lord, what we have is the entire canon of the Word of God and the Spirit of God indwelling us to give guidance. I pray you'd help us to be in communion with you, even as we have taken of it today as a reminder 
of that which we have been given through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Help us to live lives of trust. Help us to live lives of faith. And may we see you at work and give you praise and give you honor as a result. In Jesus' name, amen.